this week, the Biden administration allowed a U.N. Security Council resolution demanding demanding a ceasefire in Israel's war against the terrorist group Hamas to pass. Now, this signals a major shift in longstanding U.S. policy. Many are now asking what effect this shift in policy will have on Israel's war effort. And if Hamas fighters can hold out until summer, will the approaching elections lead to even further abandonment of Israel by our government. Joining me now to discuss this is foreign policy and security and analyst Daniel Flesh. He is a former senior advisor at Israel's mission to the United Nations and a former IDF paratrooper. Daniel, welcome to Washington Watch. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Tony. Appreciate it. So, so Daniel, the reports are that Israel's very close. The IDF's very close in eliminating Hamas. There's still about four battalions totally in attack, in, intact. Uh, the others have been kind of dispersed. It's chaotic. They've taken out command and control. But if they're forced to pull back now, uh, they could regroup. And this threat does not go away. Yes, very true. I mean, the key word here is destroy or defeat. And the question people are wondering is, what does that look like? Uh, a defeating Hamas is necessarily to wipe out or destroy all 30,000, give or take, fighters they have, but really to no longer allow them to constitute themselves as a political or military force in Gaza. So that could look like a few different ways, particularly taking out the leadership. Right now, Yahya Sinwar and Mohammed Deif, the numbers one and two of Hamas in Gaza, are believed to be in Rafah, in the southern part of the Gaza Strip near the Egyptian border. And so victory in many ways for Israel, in part, looks like either killing them, capturing them, or having them in publicly in exile to show that they're no longer a force in Gaza. Uh, and beyond that, as you mentioned, there's a few battalions left in Rafa, but uh, no longer allowing them to constitute themselves as a military force. This week alone, we've seen actually Hamas has reconstituted themselves in part in the central northern part of Gaza Strip, particularly a battle at Al-Shifa Hospital or outside Gaza City. So there will be a war even after the current campaign winds down, a guerrilla war most likely to kind of mop up the remains of the Hamas operation. But right now, Israel must and it will go into Rafa to essentially to achieve its not only military, but also its political aims vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. So, Daniel, put in perspective, you, you served at the United Nations. Uh, put in perspective this week's vote or failure to vote by the United States abstaining in this resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. Yeah, so a little context here. Last week, the U.S. put forth a draft resolution to the Security Council that did two key things. First off, it called out and condemned Hamas for the actions on October 7th. And secondly, it tied a permanent and lasting ceasefire, I believe the language was. It tied it to release of hostages. That resolution was vetoed by Russia, China, who had uh, a veto power in the Security Council, as well as, I think, Algeria. Now. Mozambique put forth a resolution earlier this week, as you mentioned, that did a few things very differently. One, it did not even mention Hamas, much less condemn Hamas. In fact, the language it uses is uh, all interested parties. Of course, Israel's a part of the United Nations. Hamas is not. So they're not exactly an interested party. In addition, it called for a ceasefire as an aside to respect the holy month of Ramadan, even though they did not respect the holiday of Simcha Torah or Shabbat back in October. But it to call for a ceasefire, and then in the next breath, also called for release of the hostages. So did not tie the two together. And this Security Council resolution, there's a few different kinds, but this one is not binding, at least in the United States uh, interpretation of it. But that's almost beside the point, because the main idea here, as you mentioned, is a change in policy. And not only are the U.S. enemies watching this, but also Israel's enemies are watching this. As you mentioned earlier, Hamas is seeing the growing daylight between the Biden administration and Israel. And they're probably thinking, Sinwar in particular, why they've rejected numerous hostage uh, exchange offers of the past few weeks and couple months, is they're probably thinking, let's just wait some more time until the Biden administration increases pressure on Israel. Let's get further along into the presidential campaign season this summer, and then we'll see what kind of pressure the Biden administration brings out on Israel, and maybe we can actually survive this war. The announcement today by the Palestinian Authority that they have uh, basically redone their government, I think it's a 
cosmetic makeover because you still had a, bo a boss is still running things. Is this um, a, a step toward the Biden administration being able to advance their two-state solution by putting the Palestinian Authority or, or wanting to put the Palestinian Authority in uh, control of, of Gaza? And part of the reason the administration focuses so much on the PA, the Palestinian Authority, is because there's no other dog in this fight, effectively. There's no other player that you can look to to actually have some sort of even technocratic governmental control, bureaucratic control over a population, over an area. So it's almost by a default reaction. But anyone who kind of checks underneath the hood even a little bit realizes the Palestinian Authority is not a viable partner. The language for years has been a viable partner for peace. But they're not even a viable governing authority among their own people. And so looking to them, and so long as Abbas is at the head of the PA, yeah, you can change the cast of characters underneath him, but the fundamental uh, policies and approach and stance towards Israel will not change. So it's a, it's a difference without a distinction. I mean, they're, they're, it's a corrupt entity. They refuse to recognize the right of Israel to exist. Um, it, it's not much different than Hamas uh, when you look at their relationship toward Israel. That's actually a very interesting analogy, and it's very true. There's something called the Taylor Force Act, which was passed a few years ago in Congress. Taylor Force was an American uh, veteran who was, uh, I believe, I forget which school right now, but he was at business school, and he was on a trip in Israel where he was stabbed to death by Palestinian terrorists. And those Palestinian terrorists are then rewarded with a stipend to right. them and their families for uh, trying to murder Jews. He, Taylor himself, was not Jewish, but he was caught in the crossfire effectively. That is so that is and, and U.S. policy is not to give money to the Palestinian Authority so long as they have this pay for slave policy. Right. And so you're right. They're no different in many ways than Hamas. And that was Hamas. money coming through UNRWA uh, that the United States has been uh, giving to the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Daniel, we're out of time. Uh, we'll uh, we'll revisit uh, this conversation because I'm sure we're going to continue to track it as it unfolds. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it.